Hey, how you doing out there in the listening world? I thank you and I appreciate you clicking. I want to preface you first by letting you know that, you know, I'm not a skilled theologian. Uh, I'm not an Ivy League graduate. I'm a regular person, moderate intelligence. I was compelled by the irony in society about certain things concerning the Holy Scriptures. I'm not a Bible thumper or a religious nut or anything like that. You know, I'm mostly majority compelled by evidence. This evidence I find in certain facts. I notice that facts are abased and, you know, narratives become exalted and strange to me. And it causes me to investigate or um, look into certain things. And this is what I came up with. 400 years. A comprehensive look into the prophecies of the sacred scriptures of the ancient Yehuda in hindsight. Now, what I intend to do in this episode is take my viewers on a comprehensive journey of prophetic Hebrew scriptures in relation to world events. I will attempt to contrast commonly held axioms against scriptural context in order to surmise that the dominant theological idea is a result of narrative or genuine prophetic interpretation. I'm going to challenge core beliefs, common misnomers with logical deduction, artifacts, and respectable historical commentary. I will suggest that the systematic oppression of a certain group is directly related to a greater alumni world agenda, and how similar to the chaos theory, all of the seemingly disconnected phenomena are all related to one group with a single mind fueled by an insidious agenda. Okay, now as you can see, I have a scripture. This is the 1611 King James Version. This is Genesis 15, 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Okay, now that prophecy in itself, I have no uh, discussion about that at this point, but I would like to get into a presentation. Narrative. What is narrative? Narrative is the version of the story from a point of perspective. A good example is a fight. In a fight, the narrative will depend on who's telling the story. An objective narrative is the ideal narrative. But what I've noticed is a dangerous trend in society where objectivity has been replaced with preconceived ideas. The narrative a lot of times is force fed to the public, subliminally and overtly, despite the facts. Well, I like to get rid of the preconceived ideas and contend the facts against the narrative. Right? This is the narrative <coughs> version of King Darius, right? And this demonstration is to show the contrast between narrative and truth and how narrative most of the time has a force called agenda behind it. And I also want to demonstrate how real a narrative can become in the minds of those ignorant of the truth. OK, so this is King Darius, so-called King Darius. OK, this is another version of King Darius. Okay. Still yet another version of King Darius. In fact, this is the only version that you'll see. You're going to go to school and this is what you're going to see. This is King Darius. So-called King Darius. All right. This is another version of King Darius. Now, I want to investigate what King Darius 
said about King Darius. I want to investigate how King Darius portrayed himself. Now this right here, what you're seeing, this is a relief panel from the treasury of Persepolis. This is actually an artifact, meaning that this is not an artistic rendering of what somebody may have thought that King Darius looked like. This is a sculpture of King Darius according to how he said that he looked. This was actually done in the time of King Darius. It was created by his artists. So in essence, the people that created this were actually looking at the Persians when they created it. This is not, you know, somebody's idea of what the Persians may have been. This is an actual artifact, right? But we want to examine this wall relief and compare it to the version that we constantly are bombarded with. All right. So uh, we want to take this. We want to blow King Darius up because we actually want to take a gander. We want to look at King Darius a little more close. Right. So, OK, what do we see? <clears throat> we see King Darius hair. Some people like to say uh, that this is his hat that he's wearing. So, you know, at this point, I'm not going to negate that. We're just going to look a little more at the detail of the image. <clears throat> we look at his beard, right? And we see that the beard looks similar to what some people will refer to as his hat. So we know that he doesn't, he's not wearing a hat on his face. <laughs> so uh, we can determine why the laws of deduction that that's probably hair on his face and being as though that the hat looks similar to the hair on his face we could deduce that that's probably his hair you know in deducing that that's his hair has no bearing on whether the narrated version is an accurate version of what king darius looked like or not you know so uh, we have to look deeper into the um actual images right so what I want to do is I want to blow this image up and I want to look at the guard. Now, if you notice, the guard's hair is similar to King Darius. And their beards are consistent with King Darius, except for they're not as long. So we can assume that they were of relative similar stock, but we still can't contrast the narrated version against this because the narrated version looks uh, more like a, a uh, modern day Middle Eastern. These people right here, you can't really tell, you know, what their stock is. You can't tell the magnitude of their complexion. So we can't contrast effectively the narrated version, right? Unless we have another artifact in which uh, we happen to have one, right? This is the freeze of the royal guards of Darius. <clears throat> this is an actual artifact, meaning that it was created in the time that uh, King Darius was alive, right? These people, these gentlemen right here are uh, the 10,000 immortals. Where you may have seen the 10,000 immortals are their most famous, I would say, they were introduced to the public was in the movie 300. The reason probably why you do not recognize them is because in the movie 300, they were depicted as having metal masks on their face, which uh, is actually consistent with the dominant narrative of um, never revealing what the people actually look like. Okay, so, you know, we can look at the, uh, the, the photograph of this freeze on the Ishtar gate, we could see that the freeze at the bottom is consistent with the top. So we can assume that these people were of similar stock. And because that all of their hair is consistent, we can assume that all of them were of similar stock. And this is one of the things that I was speaking about, about narrative and truth. Now, the question that becomes now is why 
then is it so difficult to mentally digest this reality, even in light of powerful physical evidence? Well, I suggest that it is because they are using advanced psychological techniques to impair your cognitive ability. They are using your two selves against each other. They are forcing a cataclysm of your subconscious against your conscious. They bombard your mind with images and imagery to represent a predetermined narrative. They bombard you with image after image after image everywhere you go, at every corner you turn. These images become fused into your mind through paired association. This narrative is everywhere. It's in a supermarket. It's at the register when you walk by. It's in the GameStop. It's as early as five years old, they start showing you these images in school. It's on every other television documentary to the point where your mind becomes so colluded with images of the narrated idea unlocking a powerful psychological mechanism that emanates deep from within the most powerful areas of the mind. Your subconscious accepts the idea without cognition and left uncontested, this idea becomes fused with reality. Even if you never pick up a book and subject yourself to the narrative, you've already become a victim. Even if you don't even notice it sitting on the shelf, your subconscious does. If they can appeal to your subconscious before they get to your intellect, then they know that they have won the battleground of your mind without a single shot being fired. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's advanced psychology. Okay, let's proceed. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. I have these maps up here so that you can recognize the proximity of these places in relation to each other. All right, because a lot of times we read, but if we don't know the landscape, then, you know, we're just reading. We see the names and we see the places, but we can't associate the places with actual places. If you um, get my drift. All right. So right now I got Babylon. <clears throat> Babylon was uh, founded by Nimrod. As far as the uh, biblical text goes, um, Nimrod was a descendant from the Hermetic line. I want you to notice how close in proximity Ur is to Babylon. All right. Well, first, let me show you. I got a triangle right here. The triangle represents uh, Egypt. All right. Then I got Ur. The Ur is the city where Abraham was from. I want you to also recognize the proximity of Ur to Babylon to Egypt. And I want you to note that the Most High sent Abraham into Egypt. Now, the scripture right here says that the Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. So being so that Abraham was the father of the Hebraic nation, this will be speaking specifically about him. And being though that he sojourned into Egypt means that he sojourned from Ur, Babylon, and Egypt. So these are all lands that he was familiar with and that he has known. So, you know, when it speaks about a captivity of the ancient Israelites, this begins to paint a picture that when he's speaking about these captivities, he's not talking about Egypt and he's not talking about Babylon, right? Because it says, unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, 
right? And then we go down to the um, 68, and it says, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. Okay, let's go to the next. All right, now, <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, read this whole thing. You could pause it and read it if you would like. Okay, I just want to read a certain specific part. The reason for me not reading the thing in its entirety is to save time, being that I have a lot of information to cover. Also, you know, I'm trying to eliminate all the conjectural points out of what I'm saying, because like uh, in the beginning, it speaks about uh, Cretans, those from the island of Crete. You know, and being that history has been misconstrued in such an arduous fashion, I don't even want to get into uh, that portion of the argument because I could probably do, you know, about an hour, two hours on that issue alone. But um, again, this is a Roman historian. His name was Gaius Publius Tacitus. Uh, he lived from 58 AD until 117 AD which means that he was alive during the Roman Jewish wars and which we're going to get into in detail later. I like this guy because he didn't go with the dominant narrative at that period of time. You know, a lot of these historians had to go with what everybody was saying because it was more or less a uh, policy. It was a lot of narrative and propaganda being pushed at that time. But he was one that was kind of like a stand-up guy. So I really like this guy as far as using his history. Now, I'm reading from about middle way down. You see in red letters, it says Ethiopian. So that's the sentence. It says, um, speaking about the Jews, and he's uh, considering their origins. Now, it says, many assure us that the Jews are descended from those Ethiopians who were driven by fear and hatred to immigrate from their home country when Cephas was king. Now, the reason why I picked this particular one is to acknowledge the fact that the Jews at that time could have been mistaken for Ethiopians. You know, they w must have been either of similar stock or uh, close proximity to their stock for Tacitus to have considered them being descendants of these people. So let us consider that it would not be far-fetched or a stretch of the imagination to consider the ancient Israelites of a close proximity and stock to the Ethiopians. And being that Ethiopia is a one nation that has never suffered the domination of colonialism. They've remained independent for the last 2,000 years, meaning that their stock has not changed or varied by that much. We could consider that the ancient Israelites probably looked like modern Ethiopians. Okay, let us continue. All right, what I have here is I have a map of the Roman Empire. What we're getting ready to get into is the uh, actual destruction of Judea. We're going to go step by step, show you which exactly which way the Romans uh, proceeded. In order to do that, I first would like to preface you on you know the land space that the Romans actually occupied. You know, so that we could visualize the context in which surrounded the destruction of Jerusalem. Not just the destruction, because in order to surmise a logical flight plan, we have to know the details. We have to know the context of the situation. So, again, this is uh, what the Roman Empire amassed. All the areas that you see in red are Roman provinces at this period. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we have... The Judean province, right? If you notice, we got Syria up at the top over there by Phoenicia. Okay, Syria is a very important piece of the puzzle in understanding the destruction of Jerusalem. Syria was a Roman vassal state or Roman vassal kingdom. They were very sympathetic and empathetic with uh, any of the Roman rules and regulations. Syria is a pivotal aspect to this story because Syria is where the Romans actually conglomerated all their forces and garrisons mobilized 
in Syria before they began to attack Jerusalem. So I'm going to take you on that journey. Okay, this is Antioch. This is the capital of Syria. It would have been uh, higher up. I put it, you know, where we could see it because Antioch is in the story. It's where Vespasian, who was the Roman general, when he got to Syria, that was the first city that he he stopped at. And he got troops. He organized his troops. Then he proceeded down. Okay. Now I'm reading from the histories of Josephus, the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm gonna have some of the major my major points. I'm gonna have the uh, exact location of where you could find it if you want to cross reference anything that I'm saying. You know, just so that we're on the same page. We know that I'm not just making this stuff up. All right, I'm reading from uh, book one, book three, chapter one, paragraph three. This is out of the destruction of Jerusalem by Flavius Josephus. Okay, so Vespasian sent his son Titus from Achaia, where he had been with Nero. Okay, if you look up on the map to your far right, you'll be able to see the boot. The boot is will represent Italy. Okay, to the right of the boot, you see Thessalonica, and then underneath that, you see Achaia. Achaia was a province, it was a Grecian city, <clears throat> or this is where Greece would be at. You see Macedonia, that's um, Alexander the Macedonian, and that's where he comes from. Okay, so uh, Vespasian sent his son Titus from Achaia. For those who don't know who Vespasian, Vespasian is the general in charge of the destruction of Jerusalem, and Titus is his son. Okay. Nero was the emperor of Rome at the time. So Vespasian sent his son Titus from Achaia, where he had been with Nero, to Alexandria. Alexandria is would be south from Achaia uh, across the Mediterranean Sea. Alexandria is in Egypt. Okay, he went to Alexandria to bring back with him from thence the 5th and the 10th legions. The 5th and the 10th legions were the mightiest fighting legions for Rome at that time. While he himself, when he had passed over the Helen's Pont, came by land into Syria, where he gathered together the Roman forces with a considerable number of auxiliaries from the kings in that neighborhood. Okay, now um, you see that star represents Achaia. Okay, you see that? Don't worry about that line going up. Those lines are the routes. The one coming from Antioch is will represent Vespasian's route to get to Ptolemaeus. And the dashed line coming up past Nebetia will be Titus's route from Alexandria, Egypt. All right, now... Before we uh, go any further, I want to show you the Helen's Pont. Okay, I'm going first. I'm going to show you uh, Titus's route from Achaia across the Mediterranean to Alexandria, then up and over till he got to Ptolemaeus. The reason why I picked that route, that route is arguable. I picked that route because in the story I don't have it written, but in the story he went by land through the desert to get to. Ptolemaeus and that's the way that the desert is also I'm gonna have a map later to show you um, the landscape and show you how it will be more expedient for him to take that route because he had coverage whereas though the Judeans wouldn't know that they were amassing an army against them all right now I'm gonna show you the Helen's Pont the blue circle is the Helen's Pont this is Vespasian's route to get to Syria okay this is a landscape map <clears throat> now if you could see you see the mountainous range to the far that that mountainous range is the uh, direction that I picked because that is the desert and this would have gave them cover a uh, large army plus uh, there's another part of the story that's going to come come later fact I'm going to bring it bring it up now okay Malchus also mind you let me tell you where it's coming from this is book 3 chapter 4 paragraph 2 Malchus also the king of Arabia sent a thousand horsemen besides 5,000 footmen the greatest part of which were archers so 
now we know that Arabia was involved in this destruction of Jerusalem. So Titus could have picked up the Arabians on the way through the Arabian desert. So that's another reason why I chose that route. <clears throat> okay, so now. Okay, Caesarea also met in Ptolemaeus. Now, I'm not exactly sure if it was Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea. Um, I believe that it was actually Caesarea Philippi, but it doesn't specify. So, you know, I just uh, brought Caesarea up. Both Caesarea Philippi and Caesarea were Roman cities. They were highly influenced by the Romans. So, all right, now... Let's get into it. Okay, Sephorus. Sephorus was the first city to fall. Once they heard that the Romans were coming, Sephorus was actually a Judean province in the countryside of Galilee. Once they heard that the Romans were going to attack Jerusalem, they immediately forfeited. You know, they let the Romans know they didn't want no trouble. So they conceded. They conceded their, their um, land space. Or whatever which eventually became a Roman fort for the onslaught then the next city to fall was Jatapa uh, which was not an easy battle all right then then they attacked Joppa Joppa was barely inhabited but uh, the Romans got word that the Jews were trying to take uh, Joppa or uh, trying to set up some type of military stronghold in Joppa and they went and they thwarted that okay then they got Tiberius Terrace then they got Mount Tabor Gamala the city of Gamala Gishala Gadara Mount Gezrum Gafna then they got the Hill of Saul, they took the Hill of Saul, and then from the Hill of Saul, they took Jerusalem, right? <clears throat> I'm trying to show my audience how the Romans conquered this, the province of Judea from the north to the south. The wave came from the north to the south, okay? Uh, so... Uh, you know, that's my basic premise in showing y'all how Jerusalem was essentially destroyed, okay? This is a key point that the Romans, they attacked from the north down. It was a wave all the way down till they got to Jerusalem, all right? <clears throat> now, this is uh, just showing you the city of Jerusalem and how they actually attacked the city. They had right here, you can see the, the legions in red. And then it says right here, Simeon, son of Gyarus, and the Idumeans. It makes you think that the Idumeans were on the outside, but they were actually the people that they're speaking about who are Idumeans were on the inside. That yellow is representing that orange. All right. And um, you can read in the passage below uh, who these people were and where they were at. Okay. And this is the way the Romans came. They came from the north. They flanked the west and the east sides of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, now this is more context. Okay, this is from the Iran Chamber Association. I mean, Iran Chamber Society. Uh, the Roman Parthian War broke out again in the 60s. Of the first century CE. Okay, so I know many of you don't know what Parthia is. Parthia was a combination of Iraq and Iran. Uh, they inhabited the, the old Babylonian kingdom. All right, so this is giving you context about the Parthian Empire and uh, what was going on with them at that time. Okay, <clears throat> Armenia had become a Roman vassal kingdom, but the Parthian king Volagassus appointed. Uh, excuse me, Volagassus I appointed a new Armenian ruler. This was too much for the Romans, and their commander, Gnaeus Dominitius Corbulo, invaded Armenia. The result was the Armenian king received his crown again in Rome from the Emperor Nero. A compromise was worked out between the two empires, 
In the future, the king of Armenia was to be a Parthian prince. Okay, so in essence, uh, Rome gave Armenia to Parthia and set up an Arme uh, Parthian prince as the ruler of Armenia. <clears throat> okay, so which means that Rome and Parthia had a relationship. We're going to get more in, in depth into that, what type of relationship they had. <clears throat> just so we could develop the context around the fleeing Judean diaspora. Okay, now I'm reading from the history of the destruction of Jerusalem, book 7, chapter 5, paragraph 2. Now I'm reading about halfway down. For Titus did not stay at Antioch, but continued his progress immediately to Zugma, which lies upon the Euphrates, whither came to him messengers from Vologesus, king of Parthia, and brought him a crown of gold upon the victory he had gained over the Jews. So when he destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the Judeans, this Parthian king sent Titus a crown of gold congratulating him on the victory. So, you know, this is setting the stage in the mind of the reader to understand that Parthia was not a place that the Judeans would want to flee to. Okay, now in this, if you pause it and you read it, you're going to notice that it speaks about the people in the city of Antioch complaining to Titus about the Jews. Now, these Jews are not the fleeing wanted renegade. How do we know this? Okay, we know this because if you see at the bottom, Right. It said, for they desired that he would order those tables of brass to be removed on which the Jews' privileges were engraven. Okay, now the, the tables of brass represents something that is stable. This was already a deal worked out between the Romans and the, and the Judeans that lived in that area. They had different sets of laws. So we know this is not the, the renegades. These are not the people that are wanted. Okay. So now, let's surmise the flight plan. Okay, and you're going to notice in yellow, we got Parthia, the Parthian Empire, okay, which will be um, modern day Iran and Iraq, the ancient Babylonian Empire. <clears throat> okay, then we have Armenia. Uh, the red land mass represents Armenia. Okay, the next red, red land mass represents Syria. Okay, now we got Roman Egypt. <clears throat> now we have Israel, okay? Now Israel, the Roman Jewish war, the, the fleeing diaspora, okay? Would, it would make sense for them to go south, right? But if they go that way, Right? They make the left and try to get into Parthia. They're going to jail. First of all, they can't logically get through the Arabian tribes because the Arabia sent 6,000 men, 1,000 archers, and 5,000 soldiers. And if I'm not mistaken, I, they sent 6,000 men to help smash Israel. So how could you get through the Arabian people when they just sent men to destroy you? Okay, you know what kind of reward they probably would have had on the fleeing diaspora of Judean rebels. All right, now going into Parthia is another story. Okay, because the Parthian prince sent Titus a crown of gold upon hearing that he destroyed these people. All right. So then, you know, you try to get into Armenia. That's there is a Parthian prince that resides over Armenia. So these are all sympathetic to Rome. All right, then if we try to get into Syria, that's not going to happen because that's on fire. All right, Syria is on fire right now. The Syrians are trying to get the Jews that have been living with them crucified just for being Jews. Okay, so this is not a, a place that the, the fleeing diaspora of wanted rebels would want to go. These places are hostile towards Israel. All right. So this is the only way that you're going to 
be able to go to get into Khazaria, where 90% of the modern Jewry claim that they're from, or they say that they're from, okay? Now, <clears throat> getting into these to Khazaria, you will have to get through the trifecta, Syria, Armenia, and the Parthian Empire, okay? What we can do is we could think of Israel as a ball. We could think of Rome as a bat, right? And we could think of these three kingdoms as the catcher's mitt, okay? If you go anywhere around these places, you're subject to death, execution, by fire, or sold into slavery, okay? So it's probably not a good idea to go into any of these four territories, okay? Meaning the Arabian tribes also, all right? So that's probably not a good idea. So let's draw a different itinerary and see if we can come up with a uh, flight plan that is more logical. Okay, now let's uh, reroute and let's make it this right instead of left. Axum Empire. You ask yourself, what on earth is the Axum Empire? Right? And why should I know this? Don't worry, I'm going to help you out. <clears throat> okay, in the Mariotic Roman War, you may ask yourself, the Mariotic Roman War, what is that? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you, okay? In the Mariotic Roman War of 25 to 20 BCE, Queen Amanirianus successfully repelled the armies of the Roman Empire. A legendary story of her carrying the decapitated head of an Augustus statue back to Moreau and having it built into the steps of one of the temples so that the citizens of Moreau could proudly trample on the head of the Roman icon upon entering the Temple of Victory was a story discounted by modern Eurocentric scholars until it was actually unearthed. Okay, now the Moreau head of Augustus, I got this from the British Museum website. This is the curator's comments. This head once formed part of a statue of the Roman Emperor Augustus. In 31 BC, Augustus defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium and took possession of Egypt, which became a Roman province. The writer Strabo tells us that the statue of Augustus were erected in Egyptian towns near the first cataract of the Nile at Aswan, and that the invading Kushite army looted many of them when they raided Roman forts and settlements in Upper Egypt in 25 BC. Most were later returned as a result of negotiations between the Mariotic Queen Candace. Okay, now that's incorrect because Candace actually means queen. So that would more or less read Queen Queen. Um, the, the Candace name was Aman Arianus. And the Roman general Petronius. However, this head remained buried beneath the steps of a native temple dedicated to victory at the Kushite capital, Miro. It seems likely that it was torn from a statue and placed there deliberately, so as to permanently be below the feet of its captors. Remains of frescoes from within the temple, which appeared to show Roman prisoners of war before a Mariotic ruler support this interpretation. Okay, also, this is all written down in the Mariotic script. This story is also found on the Mariotic Stella. Okay, <clears throat> so after Queen Amman Arianus' military achievement in repelling the Romans' insatiable desire for conquest and foreign taxation, the result was a kingdom never dominated by Roman legislation or jurisdiction. The region remained independent and eventually grew into the Axum Empire, an independent monarchy and political climate ripe to facilitate the escape, refuge, or safe passage through for a refugee Judean diaspora. All right, 
Now, <clears throat> we're just going to uh, examine the proximity of the Mariotic Kingdom, the Kingdom of Axum, which will be present-day Ethiopia, to West Africa. Okay. Uh, the first black dot, that's where Ethiopia is, or the Mariotic Kingdom would be. Okay. And the second black dot will represent West Africa. Okay, now this is a distance of uh, about 2,500 miles. That would be like from California to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I don't want to suggest too much at this time. You know, I want to just allow my presentation to uh, bring itself to life. We're going to get into that later, but right now we want to play. Let's get that descendant. Yeah. Okay, now we got a game show for you guys, all right? Now, this is kind of like the break up the monotony. I know it's a lot of information um, to absorb at one time, so, you know, I don't want to just bog you down. So, we're going to play a little game show, all right? Now, let me give you the... Uh, exclusives on this game show all right now what we're going to be doing is i'm going to put two artifacts up when you see one and two i'm going to put one artifact on one i'm going to put another artifact on two now these artifacts are going to be representing a certain group of people right then i'm going to get you four uh players token players at the bottom a b c and d right and what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to match the people to the artifacts. You know, we want to see how difficult it is. It might be a little bit challenging. So, you know, let's just work it out. Let's see if we could challenge you. All right, let's go. Okay, now you're going to have to think. You see the light bulb coming up, all right? You're going to have to think for this one. All right. Okay. We have an artifact. This is an artifact right here. This is artifact number one. All right, now we're going to get, let's get another artifact up here. Okay, okay, all right. All right, let's go. We have another artifact. All right, now let's get some contestants, right? Contestant A. Okay, we have a contestant. We have contestant B. All right, we have contestant C. Now we got contestant D. All right. We got all our players. We got all our contestants. All right. Let's play. Let's guess that. Descendant. All right. Let's start with artifact number one. Do you think it's A? B? C? Or D? Which one of these gentlemen at the bottom do you think? most likely could be a descendant of the person represented by the artifact and artifact number one. All right, let's go. Oh, did you pick B? Well, I'm sorry. That is not the correct answer. All right, let's try it again. But don't worry about it because we have more to come, okay? All right, let's try it again. Okay, is it A, C, or D? Which gentleman at the bottom most likely could have been a descendant of the artifact number one? Oh, you picked A. Oh, my goodness. That's it. Oh, man. Got it, man. Good job. Did a great job. Okay, now let's try um, artifact number two. <clears throat> okay, is it gentleman B, gentleman C, or gentleman D? I know that was too easy. I know, I know. All right, look. I'm going to get you guys some harder ones coming up. All right, so stay tuned. Okay, so let's move on. 
This is a quote from Universal Geography, okay, the Earth and its inhabitants. East of the Great Popo begins the Dahomey Territory, guarded by the important town of Gluhe, known to the Europeans by various names of Fida, Fida, Wida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews. During the flourishing days of the slave trade from 16th to 18th thousand were annually transported from Judah, as the Portuguese called this place, which at the time had a population of 35,000. The earth and its inhabitants. Okay, this one is coming from Press, Press and Magazine Bulletin. <clears throat> Wida, Fida, Huida, Uida, Judah, or Ajuda, is an ancient city frequented since the 16th century by Portuguese slave traders who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said Judaic and were viewed as a remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. All right, let's get some more um, historical uh, context. All right, we got Mr. Eldad the Danite. Okay, this was a 9th century Judean traveler and philologist who was generally credited with the authorship of a fanciful geographical narrative that exerted an enduring influence throughout the Middle Ages. Okay, let's see what he, let's see what he says. This is coming from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Eldad visited Mesopotamia, Egypt, North Africa, and Spain and caused a stir by his account of the ten lost tribes of Israel. He himself claimed to be a descendant of the Danites, who together with the tribes of Naphtali, Asher, and Gad, were said to have established a Jewish kingdom in Cush, variously interpreted as Ethiopia, or roughly present-day Sudan. Alright, what else do they say about him? Okay, El Hadani, for instance, a 9th century Jewish traveler, reported locating the tribes beyond the rivers of Abyssinia. Okay, for those who don't know where Abyssinia is, Abyssinia is in Ethiopia, or it's, uh, the proximity is Ethiopia. On the far side of an impassable river called Sebation. A roaring torrent of stones that had become subdued only on the Sabbath when Jews are not permitted to travel. Okay. So this is al Hadani's account of where the tribes were. Right. Now, let's see if uh, we can <clears throat> contrast that with Scripture to see if there's any validity in what he says. Let's see if the Scripture backs up what this man is claiming. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour out them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my disperse, shall bring mine offering. So uh, as we can see, uh, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia is consistent with what this gentleman is, is claiming uh, which isn't far-fetched, being as though it would actually validate the prophecy. Now, one thing that we uh, all we want to keep in mind is that um, Ethiopia is mentioned at least fifty times in the Bible. Poland is not mentioned one time, so. You know, just keep that in mind when, um, as we're doing this research. Okay. So now, 
<clears throat> let's bring up a gentleman. This is his work. His name is uh, Leo Africanus. Okay, he was uh, alive during medieval West African civilization. Okay, he would actually comment. He made commentary on what he's seen in his travels. Okay. Okay, for which cause they call Abegnai, the father of rivers. Howbeit they say that upon Nihilus do inhabit two great and populous nations, one of Jews toward the west under the government of a mighty king, the other more southerly consisting of Amazons or warlike women. Okay, so I guess we can surmise where we got Wonder Woman. Uh, also, I want to look at Jews. It's spelled I-E-W-E-S, and that is because the J was not invented at the time that this particular excerpt was published. This is the old language, the old English language. <clears throat> okay. So, unto the merchants of Tumbutu, there are very few horses bred, and the merchants and courtiers keep certain little nags which they use to travel upon. But their best horses are brought out of Barbary. And the king, so soon as he heareth that any merchants are come to town with horses, he commandeth a certain number to be brought before him. And choosing the best horse for himself, he payeth a most liberal price for it. He so deadly hateth all Jews that he will not admit any into his city. And whatsoever Barbary merchants he understandeth have any dealings with the Jews, he presently causes their goods to be confiscated. Okay, so um, this is also uh, building on a claim that Jews were in West Africa prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, now this king that they're speaking about is King Askia Muhammad, who uh, rivaled Jewish kingdoms of that era. His kingdom was Islamic. Jewish kingdoms of that area uh, clashed with uh, the Islamic kings of that area in that time period. We also have historical text in which we're going to get into validating that claim. Okay, so let's uh, learn a little bit more about the Songhai Empire. Now, the year 1591 witnessed the fall of the last of the great empires of Western Sudan. The uniqueness of the fall of the Songhai is not just that it was shot down at the peak of its glory, but that the collapse was a product of direct military aggression from North Africa. This unprecedented military adventure marked the first time a North African country would attack one in West Africa. The primary reason for Morocco's hostility against Songhai was due to economic interests. Al-Mansur, the ruler of Morocco, coveted the salt and sought to control the salt mines and gold deposits within Songhai territory, which was erroneously believed to be still in abundance at the time of the attack. Now, what I want to focus on, you guys could pause it and read if, if you wish. What I want to focus on is this invasion. Okay, this invasion, it was extra national in origin. Um, as we're going to see, there were a lot of forces involved in this invasion, most of which came from the same people, which were the Portuguese. The Portuguese mapped that land and they mapped Judah as being the ancient Judean on their own maps as many travelers have claimed that the Jews were in that particular vicinity I think I might do a presentation on on the next one give me a thumbs up if you think that I should do uh, or um, write in the comments if you think I should do a presentation on Spain because King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella chased the Jews out of Spain and those parts of Europe and their son was actually the king of Spain and Portugal at the time when Spain and Portugal financed this military uh, endeavor, which was extra national. They had the latest weaponry. They had the latest military advanced weaponry, which I'm going to show you in a later slide. The first invasion, which Morocco invaded, was thwarted. They were pushed back, beaten into submission. The second invasion had a definite European influence, you know, so we're going to keep it, keep it moving. Okay, now you guys can read this right here, but I just want to get into the European influence of um, this invasion. 
Okay, now the Spanish born general. He was Andalusian, actually. <clears throat> he was also the Moroccan slave. He was Enoch, meaning that his testicles were um, cut off so that he could he could never become uh, his his lineal descendancy was cut off. Basically, he could his child could never be sit on the throne. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to start at the bottom. All right. Okay. Al Mansur acquired the canon through his trade relationship with England. Many of the factors which led to the Moroccan victory were extra national in origin. The knowledge of advanced military tactic training and coordination came from the European members of the force. They had a national language of the invasion was Spanish. It was a span it was a Spanish mercenary force in which the weaponry that they were using was advanced for that time. They were actually shooting these cannons that the person shooting it, a lot of times if you didn't know what you were doing or you weren't an expert in using it, it was killing people. So <clears throat> they had experts or whatever. So let's get into the history. Um, these ten buck two manuscripts. Okay, let me give you a little uh, preface to the, the ten buck two manuscripts. The ten buck two manuscripts were hidden in caves and buried in the sand, while that area was dominated by the French. Once the French colonialism was pushed out of that area in the 1960s. These manuscripts, they began to dig these manuscripts out. They had certain families that were hiding these manuscripts and hiding this knowledge. Also, it was so hidden that the people of that area didn't even know that these texts actually existed. So this is a little bit about that, that the Timbuktu, the remote and ancient Sahara Desert City was until recently controlled by Al Qaeda affiliated groups is not often thought as an outpost of Jewish life yet this West African town of some 55,000 in northern Mali is still home to an estimated 1,000 descendants of Jews who converted to Islam centuries ago in three villages near the city local residents still refer to the descendants as the Jews but visitors and activists report that Malians of Jewish ancestry did not suffer from any form of discrimination, even with the infiltration of violent Islamist extremists to the region. It also appears that the ancient documents that serve as proof of Jewish life in Timbuktu survived the recent attacks on the city's historical library. Okay, the statement published in a local newspaper also makes clear that the descendants are not seeking new religious or national allegiances. It is God who made Timbuktu our land of refuge, and we are Muslims. So these people acknowledge the fact that their ancestors came over there as the Judean diaspora at some interval in history, but they had a conversion. And being that their family has been Muslim for so long, they, do, they don't even want to pursue the part of their life. But this goes to show you that there was a mass conversion of Jews to Islam in that area at some point in time. You know, and they, they do have the manuscripts to prove them. Some of these manuscripts date back to the 8th century. All right. <clears throat> Greetings, I'm Robin Walker, author of the new book Before the Slave Trade. As a black history researcher, I've often been asked to clarify facts and challenge myths about black history. Parents and school teachers need to know the facts to pass on to their children. Lecturers in black history want factual information to use as teaching material. In particular, Before the Slave Trade challenges the three key myths about black history. Myth 1. Outside of ancient Egypt, Africa has no early historical monuments of its own. 
Myth number two. Outside of ancient Egypt, Africa has no writing of its own. In Before the Slave Trade, I address this issue. The Sunday Times Magazine, 28th of January 2001, drew attention to the fact that in the West African city of Chinggeti, there are 3,450 handwritten manuscripts still held by African families and institutions. According to Olivier Blaise, some of these date back to the 8th century AD. The nearby cities of Walata and Wadane have perhaps 6,000 manuscripts. Professor John Hunwick has made it his business to study the old manuscripts of the city of Kano. So, what is in these manuscripts? Professor Charles Stewart of Illinois University estimates, quote, that a quarter will be jurisprudence, 10% will be Sufism, which is mysticism, 10% Arabic language, 10% studies of the Quran, 10% literature, 10% biographies of the Prophet Muhammad and Hadith, which is tradition, and 10% theology. The remaining 15% is likely to include works on history, logic, ethics, biography, mathematics, astronomy and astrology, medicine, encyclopedias, education, and geography. We're going to go into um, a little bit of Bible prophecy. Okay, this right here, this is an artifact, right? This artifact is dated between 100 AD to 200 AD. It's in the catacombs of Rome. When I say artifact, I mean that this is history. This is during the time when Yeshua actually lived. Yeshua, if you don't know who I'm speaking about, I'm referring to who people call Jesus today. All right, so this is coming out of Luke 21 through 24. <clears throat> It reads, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to them that give suck in those days. Okay, so those days, when he speaks of those days, he's talking about a time coming. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon these people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled okay so let's examine that excerpt captive into all nations what does captive mean captive means captured not of your will spoil booty loot Capture, captive means imprisoned, slavery, okay? Slaves are captive, meaning that they don't have a choice, okay? It doesn't say that they're going to migrate into all nations. Uh, modern theologians like to use the word, oh, well, they're scattered in all nations. Okay, well, if they're scattered in all nations, the question is, or the question remains, how did they get there? Because the Mashiach said that they will be led captive into all nations. They will be taken as capture into all nations. Not captive into the European nations. Not captive into the African nations. Not captive into the Asiatic nations. It says captive into all nations. Alright, so once we establish... That captive is imperative into understanding the prophecy that the Mashiach has established. Then we could, uh, we have to move on to the second portion. Of it. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay, so in order to um, <coughs> understand that portion of uh, the text. We have to know who the Gentiles are. Okay? I happen to have a genealogy map of uh, the Gentile nation. Okay, and you can find this in Genesis 10, 1 through 5. <clears throat> All right, I have, I'm going to have five pop up for you to read. Uh, before. 
Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Unto them were born sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshesh, and Tiris. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, and Togomar. And the sons of Javan, Elishish, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodenim. And it says, okay, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his, his tongue, after their families, and their nations. <clears throat> okay? So, he just listed, you know, the genealogy of the Gentile nations. Okay? <clears throat> so, in order to establish truth, let's see if any of these nations are related to any of the people that are presently living in Jerusalem. Because Yeshua stated that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. And oh, matter of fact, I do want to uh, let you guys know that if you don't have a King James Bible, then it, it might not be in there. Because uh, in a lot of these new Bibles, uh, they're taking that out, that portion out of you know, the description of who the Gentiles actually are. All right. So let's check the genealogy. Okay. Jephthah, Gomer, Magog, Ashkenaz. Huh? Ashkenaz? Ashkenaz, I heard that name before. Ash Ashkenazi Jew, the Ashkenazis. The Ash so the Ashkenazis are Gentiles by biblical standards. That's strange. If you don't know, right? So you know, if you do, when you do know, you understand that it's fulfilling exactly what. Yeshua, the Mashiach, has stated is that Ju Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Okay? So, we want to examine this state, this, um, <clears throat> this portion in depth, okay? Captive into all nations. All right, so we have um, Africa, Europe, and Asia. But can we say that this is all nations? Okay, because these are the nations of the known world prior to the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, well, the Gentiles didn't know about the other land. So what happened? Well, this was the known land mass for the uh, dominant kingdoms of the earth at that time. But the scripture says that these people are going to be taken captive into all nations, right? Not just the three we know about. It's going to, we're going to be taken into the nations that you, you don't even know about yet. So when the world expanded, when the kingdoms of the earth expanded, the prophecy had to expand to establish himself. Right, because it says that you're going to be taken captive into all nations. So it says, uh, this is Deuteronomy 32, 30 and 2. Okay, 1611 King James. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee. So, you know, in essence, what this is saying is that he knew already from the beginning that both of these things were going to happen. It wasn't a, a, a sense of, um, oh, well, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you don't make it, or if you don't, um, do, if you don't break my covenant, then, 
you know, the curses won't come to you because this is clarifying that both these the curse blessings and the curses are going to come to these people or the children or the descendants of these people. Right. So and thou shalt call them to mind among the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. And thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shalt obey his voice according to all that it, I command thee this day. Thou and thy children with all the, thine heart and with all thine soul. If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven. From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee. And from thence will he fetch thee. Okay, now uh, modern uh, theologians and modern uh, uh, Christian scholars, they say, oh, well, we know that the children of Israel weren't scattered in heaven, so he couldn't have been talking about that. But I beg to differ. It reads as though he's saying exactly what he says. He says... If any of thine be driven out unto the uttermost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. In essence, if he is the one that caused the end from the beginning, then he will understand that technology is going to advance to the point where there's people are going to be traveling in and out of heaven. And what this is saying is exactly what it says. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. You know, it's articulated so simplistic that it's complicit, right? So let's proceed. Okay, it's coming from Jeremiah 16, 13 through 15. Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers. And there ye shall serve other gods, day and night, where I will not show you favor. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said that the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but that the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all of the lands where he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave their fathers. Okay, here we go. Well, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's play this game show. Okay, we got another episode of Guess That Descendant. All right, let us get two artifacts up here. Okay, we have artifact number one. Okay, this artifact is uh, coming from the Assyrian wall relief. All right, so let us get another artifact up here. This is artifact number two. We can find this artifact in the Worcester Art Museum. All right, so now we got to get a couple contestants. All right, we got contestant A. Okay, we got another contestant. Cont lucky number contestant, lucky letter contestant B. Contestant C. And contestant D. All right. Now let's see if we can guess that descendant. Okay, we're going to start with 
the Worcester Art Museum artifact. Now, which one of these uh, gentlemen at the bottom do you think could have possibly been a descendant of the gentleman depicted by the artifact? Okay. Is it A, B, C, or D? Don't hurt your brain now. All right? Oh, that was just too easy. All right, all right, all right. All right. We got a studio audience here, so you can wait. You can have a little nice little suspense pause before you actually make your pick. All right, all right. Come on, we got to keep this interesting now. Let's do uh, the Assyrian wall relief now. Which one of these gentlemen at the bottom could have possibly been a descendant or in all probability been a descendant of these gentlemen depicted in this wall relief? Okay. Is it A, C, or D? You guessed it. Oh, man. Yes, you did a good job. We're going to have our third and final game show coming up. And if you uh, win on that one, then we're going to get you out a lifetime supply of non-fluoridated toothpaste. All right. Okay, now let's move on. Okay, what we have here is two photographs. Um... I'm going to get some scriptural text right, so we can contrast these ideas. All right. It says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flyeth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Right? So, <clears throat> the reason why I picked this is because this particular excerpt is extremely, extremely streamlined. It is extremely specific, okay, because <clears throat> in understanding the history of this Israelite nation, right, we understand that... Um, in Egypt, where they sojourned at, right? We know that in the beginning I spoke about Abraham, who was the father of the nation, right? And how he was sent to sojourn in Egypt. What you're going to notice is that he did not bring an interpreter with him, which signifies that they understood that language. They had some type of relationship with that language, okay? When they went into slavery in Babylon prior to that they had a commerce relationship with the people of Assyria and Babylon right so they understood that language okay now when they also went and were sold as slaves by the Romans uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed one of the main reasons that they went to war with the Romans is because Nero wanted to put a statue of himself inside the holiest of holies. And they did not make images of their God, nor did they permit any images to be in the sanctuary. And that was total sacrilege. And they were willing to die to uphold that. So, in essence, what that means is that they had a relationship with Rome. They understood the Roman tongue. They understood the Greek tongue. Now, in this particular scripture says, A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So, you know, in understanding that, we know that it could not have been talking about either three of these captivities. So, which captivity is it actually talking about? Now, if you can establish that there were Israelite kingdoms in West Africa, then that is enough 
to establish that this scripture is prophetic in nature and that the fulfillment of this scripture was fulfilled during the transatlantic slave trade. Okay, and now also it says a nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. <clears throat> you know, in most uh, cases, in most captivities, people at least are uh, most oppression. They usually, you know, don't, it doesn't extend to, to the young. The young are usually off limits in normal circumstances, but not in, not in all circumstances. So, you know, this is another uh, pretty singular prophetic utterance, you know, I believe. It says, okay, this right here is a uh, photograph of uh, the late Emmett Till a 14 year old young man who was beaten he was bludgeoned to to death in a brutal in the most brutal fashion by a grown man for nothing he didn't you know molest anybody he didn't rape. he wasn't accused of rape he wasn't accused of theft he was accused of looking looking at someone okay so you know i uh you, you're going to get your people that says, uh, say, oh, well, that was 1955. That was a long time ago. We've come such a long way from then. Why are you bringing up the past? You know, and uh, I defer and move and progress to the, to the present, right? This is uh, that young man's marker, right? This is October 19, 2016. Okay, now you have to ask yourself, right? What is it about these people? What have these people done specifically to the group who are initiating these vicious attacks to warrant this type of feeling towards these people. This is what you have to begin to ask yourself. Like, okay, what's going on in the psychology of these people? Whereas though, you know, they feel that this is in some way, shape, form, or fashion acceptable. Okay, this is 70 years later. This is the brutal death of a child, of a 14-year-old baby you know by the hands of grown men you understand so you have to ask yourself like what's going on with these people whereas though they feel this type of way it's like when you think about it, it it's it's really nothing that it could be what's going on is that these people are fulfilling prophecy Th these i mean at the end of the day um there's no psychological explanation that can explain what's going on, except that this is something supernatural. This is something extra spiritual that's going on with these people. OK, this is 70 years after the fact. They are still taking their time to go out and intentionally destroy this landmark of this child this baby you understand so it's it's some things going on. these people are fulfilling prophecy they don't know it it's like if pharaoh knew that he was fulfilling prophecy would he have took his army into the red sea of course not he would have said you know what uh i don't even know why i'm chasing these guys man like this why am i chasing these people Right. But he was given a blindfold. Why was he given a blindfold? He was given a spiritual blindfold so that he could chase these people into this river. So the name of the most high could be established in the earth. 
Okay, and if you understand the Hebraic language a little bit, you know that name doesn't just mean your actual name. Name also means your reputation. You understand? So that's what's going on with these people. These people are fulfilling scripture. Because if they knew that they were fulfilling scripture, they wouldn't do it. They, I mean, it, it wouldn't make any sense in any other aspect. Okay, so let's go to, I'm going to um, show you just how. I'm gonna, and I'm also going to show you what's going on, why they can't see any of this. You know, people um, credit cognitive dissonance, and they, uh, among a lot of other things, in which th this does play a part. But it's more going on than just that, uh, as we'll see, All right? <clears throat> So, right here, I got the uh, I got two signs. We're going to get into um, this a little bit later, right? But I want you to focus on something else, okay? These are memorial markers for uh, the free blacks of Israel. Hell, okay? These were the Israelites that were set free by uh, Thomas Jefferson's cousin. Well, actually, the wife of his cousin, uh, you know, under the will of the cousin. Okay, these are the first documented Africans in English America, 1619. These are memorial markers. But <clears throat> what I want you guys to focus on is I want you guys to focus on not the actual inscriptions in the marker. I want you to, you know, identify that these are so-called memorials. These are memorials for these different type of events. This is supposed to be, I guess, uh, I want to say like a good thing. Or whatever but what you're going to notice is that if you look up top the two things that you see that's similar in these uh, memorials is you see <clears throat> a triangle with a circle inside of it and an image um, inside of this circle now what we're going to do is we're going to blow these uh, these images up and we're going to evaluate those because see that struck me as strange that they would create a memorial and then incorporate something so demeaning in that memorial which made me take a closer look a gander at uh, the actual image and the nature of this image okay so now what we see is we see a triangle with a circle inside and we see a image and this image that's inside the circle is a man standing on top of another man signifying conquer or subdue now this image that's uh, we see in the center if anybody that knows anything about witchcraft can understand that actually this is a sigil and what a sigil is is uh, it's a desire that spoken or projected in the center of the circle and it's imprisoned by the three corners of the triangle but usually in these forms of magic like uh, you know if you research this, the triangle of Solomon or a sorcerer's triangle you understand that this is not anything that's uh, foreign or, or new but when you start to look for a triangle facing downward it's virtually impossible to find you can't find anything speaking i've been to the library i've been all over trying to get this understanding of why is the triangle pointed downward usually it's pointed up right but i've discovered this is high sorcery this like the other stuff is like you know this the stuff that people play around with Ouija boards, you know, witchcraft, things of that nature. Um, but when you're dealing with high sorcery and very, very dark magic, these things are enshrouded in secrecy. These things are very hard. You can't just go to a book and get this stuff. This type of um, sorcery is, is very volatile. It's very dangerous. It's like, you know, you try to put a uh, love spell on your girlfriend or something like that and um you know if you don't do it 100 accurate or right you know your <clears throat> your mother ends up 
getting burnt in a fire, not dying of smoke inhalation, but dying a, a, a horrible death. Like this is like this is the type of magic that you don't play with. Right. This is high level sorcery and people that don't think that this is happening. You know, you can ask um, Hillary Clinton about her little spirit cooking uh, rendezvous and what that entails. So we're going to look and see where the symbol pops up. It seems to pop up in strange places. And when people question or inquire about the symbol, nobody knows anything. Oh, no, you know, well, it's just it's just something. We just wear it. It doesn't mean anything. OK, but we all know that these people that operate in these circles, they speak through symbols. You know, they don't. You necessarily use the same language that we would use, our, uh, the verbatim that we use, because everybody can understand that. So they, they speak to each other in a language that only they understand. This is why they do that. Okay, so where else do we find this symbol? Ah, uh, okay. So now it starts to make sense. Right now it begins to be more concise. We our vision begins to get a little more singular. Um, once we start seeing this symbol in these different places, right? Okay, we see the um, the upside down triangle. Right, we understand what it's attached to. So, you know, we know how they feel. Um, towards these individuals, right? So you got to ask yourself, why would this symbol be on top of a memorial marker, right? But that still doesn't explain the sigil in the middle and, and what's going on with that, the spirituality that's going on with that. So, um, you know, through a lot of clicking and a lot of research, I've actually found when you're looking for this stuff, you have to be specific in order to find it um and with no further ado let me let you know right this is called the aramaic east circle okay this is ancient babylonian magic right here this is high luciferianism okay this is what's going on and what they're doing this right here is the luciferian circle of evocation you, you can read and find out what's going on with that. Ephesians 6 and 12 lets us know that for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, so basically what's going on is, you know, it's more under the surface why these people are doing the things that they're doing and why they're acting why they act the way that they act these symbols right here represent an idea right now this idea is projected into certain aspects of life right and what they do is they put these symbols on things to acknowledge between them so they know it doesn't really have anything to do with us, right? You know, we the common people, right? And you got to wonder, it's like, okay, well, African-Americans have been complaining about police brutality for the longest time. Just in recent times, you know, the, with the advent of cameras on uh, cellular devices, right? We've been able to capture a lot of this stuff you know, to confirm that this is this is not something that somebody's imagining. This is really happening, right? And you know, the spirituality of of these people, right, is to deny they genuinely can't see anything wrong. It's because of the spiritual aspect of it. Their eyes are closed. They can't see it because they don't know that. These people are doing uh, witchcraft, right? So we ask ourselves, oh, why does the institution 
permit this? Why does the institution of policing permit this type of behavior? It's because they're all under the same power. They're all underneath the same jurisdiction. Now, don't take what I'm saying and get it misconstrued. I'm not insinuating that this gentleman sitting in this squad car has any idea of the symbolism and what it represents that's sitting on the side of this car. He has, he, this guy don't have no idea that the symbol that he has on the side of his vehicle is a symbol of oppression. It is a satanic symbol of sorcery. He don't understand this. It's because the knowledge disseminates from the top down. These people at the helm of these organizations who give license to this for this symbol, these are the people that I'm talking about. The institution. It's like, why, if you have a anomaly in an institution or any type of business, especially when it's dealing with negligent behavior, for you not to address the negligent behavior is negligence in itself. This is destructive. This is like having termites in your house. Okay? For you not to address the negligence that's going on, it's like, okay, well, in uh, Ohio, a state where it's totally 100% legal to walk around with an AK-47, a child is in the park playing with a toy gun, and the police jumps out and executes him within one second. This officer is not even charged with the crime. Nobody bats an eye about this. It is the institution that is giving governance to the criminal behaviors. At the end of the day, if you even want to take and look at it from another perspective, right? These police unions, due to these negligent acts, right, are paying out billions of dollars. Billions of dollars are being paid out for these actions, right? Who do you think is paying for that? When you get pulled over <clears throat> and a, a seemingly frivolous ticket, you go to court and it's $200, 225 a ridiculous amount for such a minor infraction, you're paying for his negligence. It will behoove you to consider. And the thing is, the most important uh, aspect of it is that the people who are where this, these policies are emanating from, who are germinating these ideas that this behavior is somehow appropriate or mandated, the people that create an acidic environment in the body of humanity for disease to flourish okay these people are the problems well I intend to peel back the lapels of the fabric I intend to show what is underneath the pixels okay what's really going on and what's happening beneath the surface because there's things that's going on underneath the surface and behind the scenes that we do not understand and I intend to reveal to the people who is actually responsible for what's going on for what's happening for what you're seeing it's the power behind the power Okay, these are ancient deities. Okay, the people in these positions that's implementing these ridiculous ideologies, right, are powered by ancient deities. You understand? This is nothing new. This battle is an ancient battle that has spilled over into modern time. 
We have bits and pieces and remnants of what's going on. But the truth is, the people are being manipulated by a small, seditious group of individuals. These individuals control all or most of the mainstream information distribution centers. People keep saying that it doesn't matter. The past doesn't matter. The past does matter. Because this seditious group of individuals are the ones that are controlling the information governing the past. They're creating paradigms in your mind that are not real. They create narratives in opposition to evidence. Their most powerful resource is what I like to call intellectual mercenaries. These people are very dangerous, highly educated, and respected public figures who lend their influence and intellectual prowess to the agenda of certain groups. These individuals are afforded all the lights and bells that opulence can provide. The machine uses these intellectual mercenaries along with the inherent credulous nature of man and their mob psychology to navigate the ship in the direction that it sees fit without regard to the safety or security of the passengers or the cargo. When is it not okay to challenge an idea in which the facts align in a manner that is not consistent with reality based on tangible evidence? When is blind obedience demanded in such an arduous disregard to the truth that parenthesis the facts? In what society is the truth considered detestable? And the falsification of facts esteemed and glorified. This very idea is a social disease. This disease has absorbed, has absorbed deep, deep into the deep tissue of the But the administrators of the monetary industry are majority shareholders in the interests of this machine. But when you look at historical figures like Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, those whose impact and influence on civilization is felt worldwide, you cannot measure their success in a devil's, devil's currency. Current. Okay, now let's proceed. Now, mind you, this uh, next group of slides are going to be graphic. What I want you to do is, I want you to center your mind. I want you to focus. I want all my viewers to focus, right? Not on the horrible acts that you see going on, okay? Because that's a distraction, all right? The people that have gone through these horrible events, they're no longer in those vessels. Those vessels that you see are temporary. Okay? What I want you to do is, I want you to look at the people. Look at the people. Don't focus on the horror, because if you focus on the horror, then you're going to miss something very important. You have to ask yourself, what's going on with the people? What's happening in the spiritual hub of the people? What's wrong with the people? 
You see this a, a little girl, 12 years old, enjoying this horrific scene. Look at the people. Don't focus on the horror. Because if you focus on the horror, you're going to miss something very important. Okay, because in the crowd, you can see what's going on. That is extra spiritual. What's going on? This is, has more to do with just hating niggas. It's more to the story. You understand? Look at the people. Look at the crowd. Okay, because once you begin to look at the crowd, certain things in your mind begin to spark. Your mind begins to spark. You start saying, how could, how could human beings come out to see such a horrifying act? What is leading these people? Who is the Pied Piper that is leading these people to do these horrible, horrible things? And why would you want to see it? Look at the people. All right? Because when you look at the people, you begin to understand that it's more going on. It's more going on than what's on the surface. You have to look underneath the surface. And every time that you look underneath the surface, the same God is, is the Pied Piper. It's the same deity. It is the same ancient war that's being manifest. In humanity, these people are being used. You understand? Now, what I want to do is I want to show you exactly how these people are being used, right? Because I found I had some groundbreaking discovery on my behalf, anyway. I don't know, you know, I might be the last to know these things, but I'm definitely going to share it with the world. This gentleman, Albert Pike, is a very notorious Confederate leader in Confederate ideology. Um, as you know, the Confederate was the fraction of the United States government who wished to keep slavery. I'm in no way insinuating that the Civil War was over slavery, but it was so tied to slavery. It was so bound to the institution of slavery. The reason why the country actually went to war was not over slavery, but slavery was so tied into the, the alumni banking agenda. It was it was locked, it was ball and chained to this idea that it had to be uprooted in order to uproot the idea. Because this idea was destroying. The American dream. You understand? Well, maybe not, but let's go in because I'm going to show you what I mean. All right. Albert Pike. Right. Albert Pike, the Confederate general. But let me give you some relationships that uh, you might not know. That Albert Pike was not just a uh, general in the Confederate army. The Confederacy was majorly tied to the interests of the alumni banking um, institution. They were also heavily funded by Britain <coughs> and its interests. Okay, Abraham Lincoln, along with uh, a few other presidents of the United States, was trying to regain control of the country from the money system that had taken root, a deep root in this country. Did you ever wonder why this banking problem has never gone away? Have you ever, like, considered, okay, well, you know, they get rid of the bank. You know, Andrew Jackson, one of his most famous quotes is, I killed the banks. 
Okay, so why do they own your country now? Abraham Lincoln tried to kill the banks. But why are, do they keep coming back? Okay, first of all, you have to understand who they're praying to. You have to understand their gods that they worship. The gods that they worship, normal people don't understand it. And once you begin to understand this, right, and you look at the trends in history, see the people in those positions, they know that by oppressing a certain group of people in this country that they get power from their God because this is an ancient war going on that people don't understand. OK, this is a Confederate officer. Why is there a Jewish synagogue? named after him in his honor you have to ask yourself right okay let's proceed because i don't want to give you too much but um i do want you to look at the um thing i have on on the right side now pan this is one of the most powerful deities in their ideology right this is why you keep seeing the face of the goat okay because that's who they were they worship the goat man all right now, this gentleman right here laid out the foundation for World War I and World War II. What does World War I and World War II have to do with the Confederacy? Well, what it has to do is it, the American people are being used. That's what's really going on, okay? This is why the information is so convoluted and, and colluded, right? It's because, first of all, nobody thinks that it matters, Second of all, the people are being used by these high interest groups to do their will based on what they think, right? This is why you could get, um, I'm not going, I don't want to get this um, shut down before I get started, so I'm not even going to get into that, but, Okay. Now, this is the capital of the United States, okay? This is another uh, structure dedicated to this gentleman, okay? So you have to understand that, you know, the high officials in this government are all part of the same ideal, right? And those who go against the grain, we know what happens to them. Right. But the American people are being used to further this agenda. They're being used through their ignorance of what's really going on. Right. OK, Mr. Albert Pike, the original Ku Klux Klan founded in Polunsky, Tennessee. Now, if you go look up that name. Right, Polunsky, right? You're going to find out that this, whoever this town was named after, is connected to a certain group. These are all the same people, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. All right. In 1866, the order was disbanded around 1869 by six Confederate officers, including 33 degree Scottish Rite Freemason Albert Pike and Nathaniel Bedford Forrest. Now, now, mind you, there is no controversy with Forrest being a founder, right? But Albert Pike is shrouded in secrecy, is because that these people esteem him in such a high place, right? Because this it's, it's an agenda that's going on. Right now, he was the first imperial wizard of the KKK. Albert Pike, who was a Satanist, held the office of chief justice of the KKK while he was simultaneously sovereign grand master of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Okay, so we have the founder of the KKK, in which a Jewish synagogue is dedicated to him. A Talmudic 
Masonic Jewish synagogue. Now, this brings a question to me, right? That, you know, it recently hit me, even though internally the question was always there, but it was never verbalized. Did you ever notice how the KKK claims, lays claim, that they hate Jews, but they only kill niggas. They hate Jews with a passion, but they only kill niggas. Does anybody besides myself find that strange? Well, I did. I, I, I found that unusually, unusually, um, abnormal like so you know I began to look into a uh, certain couple of things and that these Talmudists are extremely elusive and you know they were the power behind basically the whole confederate idea these same people are the same idea that initiated the slave exchange these people go back for centuries implementing and instituting these insidious practices in these civilizations so that they can in turn disintegrate the moral fabric erecting the fallacy in the earth and praise of their God in opposition to the creator. This is what's going on. The people are being used for the agenda of these people. Or these groups, right? And let me show you. Keep don't don't lose your focus. Because there's a couple other things I need to show you on this page. First, we're gonna get Judah P. Benjamin, right? This was another Talmudic interest in the Confederacy, right? And um, this gentleman right here was the go to guy for the financing. What I want you to pay close attention to is we're going to get back to the KKK. Now, the KKK was started after the Confederate lost in the war. They were formed during the Reconstruction era of the country, they were formed as a mercenary group. Right. This was a mercenary faction formed to reorganize that which was already in place. OK. This is how the, this is how the, the money changers got their hand back in the cookie jar. This is how this is why America controls very little of its wealth. This is why America is in so much debt to this day. Is because these groups were put in place to destroy the integrity and the fabric, to manipulate the people into oppressing a certain group of people. You understand? It's because the God that they serve know who these people are. The people don't know. The people go by what the mainstream intellectual community disseminates they think that we can't put two and two together right and then they add the confusion into it and if they figure you give them confusion then that's enough to keep them busy from sun up to sundown you understand but these mysteries are being revealed to those that are listening and have ear to hear common sense Right. So let's look at this K. Right. Because uh, I looked at the letter K. I said, that's interesting. Why would they you ask you ask or you Google? Why did they use KKK, though? Right. Well, here we go. Look. K. Happens to be the 11th letter of the English alphabet. Right. So K 
equals 11, numerically. K plus K plus K equals 11 plus 11 plus 11. And we, we can do simple math, right? It's not that complicated. When you think about it, you understand what's going on is you people are being manipulated, man. And they're doing things that don't necessarily make sense. But, you know, as long as you have these intellectual mercenaries, right, that are standing and co-signing what's going on and not saying anything about it, you look to them, right? But they're bought. You understand? You have to be able to look at something, to look at a thing, like this picture that I have up here. Of this hall, right? You have to be able to look at this hall and not just see a table, right? You have to be able to see the outline of the table and what is the picture actually saying. You have to be able to look at the lamp sitting on the table and not just see a lamp. You understand? You have to be able to see the underlying theme. What's going on right before your eyes? And underneath your nose, because it's happening. Your country is being taken. It's being usurped. Your spirituality is being sapped and given to another God. You understand? Now let's get Mr. Abraham Lincoln, right, to just drive my point home where slavery was not the fundamental root of what the war was fought over, okay? Slavery was advertently tied to the fundamental root. It was fused and meshed with the fundamental root. There was no other way to get rid of the problem by cutting out everything, which included slavery. But in that, Right. They still made amends to keep it going. Right. And this is how the enemy crept back in. This is why you don't have a country now. Because you don't understand that these people that are praising these certain entities and beings, they are the ones that are manipulating you into believing that this is OK. They are the ones that are manipulating you. Like even the Talmudists, if you go back into the Bible, you could look and see that they manipulated the Romans to hang the Messiah, right? Because in their law, they feel like, okay, well, if I didn't do it, then my hands are not dirty. If I could manipulate somebody else to do it, then my hands are not dirty. What's going on is the people are being manipulated into destroying the children of the Most High in the name of of whatever name comes, but they don't know that the people who govern them, who rule them, who manipulate them, they don't understand why they're doing it. Again, this is an ancient war. This war has been going on for thousands of years. Okay, now let's read um, Abraham Lincoln. He says, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. And it's not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. So his desire wasn't to free the slaves. His desire was to save the Union. And by saving the Union, he had to uproot the banking stronghold that was on the country, okay? Mainly the South. So it was a crossroads where slavery and finance crossed a cross section. And in that cross section is where the Civil War was born. It was tied. It was advertently tied to these parasitic ideals, idealisms, right? 
And what happened? After the country had the civil war, they began to, again to oppress the children, the daughter of his disperse. Right? And what happened? The banks got regained their power. Right? And they began to creep back in. Because it's directly tied. They're lock and step. It's no way you're going, you're going to do one without the other. You can't. So by oppressing the people, you only oppressing yourself because your oppressor is dependent on your oppressing the people. I know that's hard to follow. You might have to rewind it and go back through it, but it makes sense. And this is the problem that still resides today. But the people, I'm not going to say they're ever going to get to understand it, right? But... Let's see what uh, Frederick Douglass had to say about Abraham Lincoln. All right, let's proceed. Okay, now uh, <clears throat> let's get another key figure. And uh, let's get Thomas Jefferson. All right, let's call Thomas Jefferson up and see what he has to say. This is a quote from Thomas Jefferson. All right, he said, Indeed. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, that considering numbers, nature and natural means only, a revolution of the will of fortune, an exchange of situation is among possible events that it may become probable by supernatural interference. The Almighty has no attribute which can take side with us in such a contest. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to look into the mind of Thomas Jefferson when he was writing this. What could he possibly have been thinking about? What? Why would he say this? Why would he even bring in supernatural interference into the equation? Why would he bring the Almighty into the equation? Well, I have a little bit of light on a possible reason that he could have been feeling this type of way. Right? Is what did he know? Is the question. Right? Now, this right here is the Free Blacks of Israel Hill marker, right? How does that relate to Thomas Jefferson, okay? Just to the west lies Israel Hill, settled in 1810 to 1811 by approximately 90 formerly enslaved persons who received freedom and 350 acres from Rudolph, Judith Rudolph under the will of her husband. Richard Randolph, cousin of Thomas Jefferson. These Israelites and other free African Americans worked as farmers, craftspeople, and Appomattox river boatmen. Some labored alongside whites for equal wages and defended their rights in court. The family of early settlers, settler Hercules White, bought and sold real estate in Farmville and joined with white citizens to found the town's first Baptist church in 1836. Israel Hill remained a vigorous black community into the 20th century. 
All right, so you notice that Thomas Jefferson's cousin will this land, 350 acres, to these Israelites and other African Americans. So why would they put that in there? Why would they not omit Israelites from this marker? Because it was in his will. To put that because he knew that those people were Israelites. What's going on is these people are trying to save their soul. They're trying to make amends, right? Now, you could believe the dominant narrative over the artifacts. But where is that going to lead you? These people was trying to save their soul. You understand? But anyway, all right, so I got a question, right? My question is, do you think that the United States government could have kept its black citizens under such a brutal and domineering garrison for the last 398 years? If his citizens had a clue that the same people that they were oppressing were direct bloodline descendants of the Israelites of the Old Testament. You know, and that's just this question, right? It's just a hypothetical question. Question is, do you think that the United States government could have kept its black citizens under such a brutal and domineering garrison for the last 398 years if its citizens had a clue that the same people that they were oppressing were direct bloodline descendants of the Israelites of the Old Testament? That's my question. All right. Now, um, let's lighten up a little bit and um, let's proceed. Come on, let's go. This is our game show now. Come on, we're gonna play Guess That Descendant. All right, now come on, you guys know how this is played. This is the third and final shot. We have consolation prizes at the end. All right, get your brain, get your minds ready, get focused. Put your thinking caps on, because here we go. We got artifact number one. Okay. Now we have artifact number two. Now let us get some contestants here. We got contestant A, contestant B, contestant C, and contestant D. All right, so we're going to start with artifact number one. Do you think it's A, B, C, or D? Now, out of these um, four contestants, which one do you think could have possibly been a descendant of the person depicted in the artifact? On the left. All right. Come on, guys. Oh, you picked A. You are absolutely right. All right. You guys are on a roll. Okay, now, so let's go with artifact number two. You got one right. All right. Is it B? C or D? Oh. AI, come on, man. AI. AI, come on, man. You, you're giving it away. Oh, man. Come on, man. 
man. You AI man, you are just you are just too much, man. All right. Well, I guess we got to give that to you. You right. All right. So we're gonna get you guys out the consolation prize. We're gonna get you a year's supply of unfluoridated toothpaste. Yeah, keep your mind right, man. Don't let these people pull the wool over your eyes. All right. Okay, um, I thank you guys for watching. This is the conclusion of uh, my presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you liked it, you can give it a thumbs up and share it with somebody. You know, if not, that's fine. You know, but I, I hope it stimulated your intellect. Have a great day or evening and never let them stop you from thinking.